grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, and welcome to online worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. What a joy it is to gather together to worship. All of the words that you need will be right on your screen, so please join us in the responsive readings, sing the hymns nice and loudly and joyfully, and enjoy worship. We may be in separate places physically, but we are spiritually united in Christ. So what a joy it is to worship together. One quick announcement before we begin our service. We um, have been having in-person worship services at the church. We have suspended those not only for today, but also next Sunday, November 8th. We're hoping to pick back up November 15th, but we'll keep you posted. Uh, the reason for that is I was diagnosed with COVID this week, so I am under a very strict quarantine. Um, this is about the farthest that I will leave my house, and this is my front yard. So, <laughs> um, obviously I'm not coming to the church. I'm not going anywhere. So, um, once I am well again and testing negative, um, then the session will revisit our in-person worship protocols and we'll keep you posted. But now, let us worship. Won't you join me in our call to worship? This is the good news which we will proclaim to you. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Walk in the light of his love. Live in the light of his teachings and healing mercies. Come, let us worship the one who overcame death. Let us celebrate the triumph of our Lord. Amen. And let us go now into a time of confession. We will pray first silently, and then we will pray together. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. And let us pray together. Gracious God, we confess that we far too often want proof for everything. It is easy for us to point our finger at Thomas, who was honest about his fears. Jesus said to him, and he says to us as well, Peace, be still. Do not doubt, but believe. Lord, forgive our unbelief. Forgive the many times when we think and act in ways which are hurtful and mean heal our wounds, bind up our spirits in the cords of your compassion. Help us to fully place our trust in you with our whole hearts and minds and spirits and souls. For we ask this in your blessed name. Amen. This is the good news of God's grace. That we were sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
before we hear God's written word, let us turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, how we thank you for this morning, for this time together where we can spend some time just in worship, worshiping you, Lord, singing your praises, praying to you, hearing your word. And Lord, we pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, opening our ears and our hearts and our minds so that as we hear your written word, we hear your voice and we know the message that you have prepared for each and every one of us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master and you are all siblings. And do not call on anyone, do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
we're still walking through the words of Jesus in the days ahead of his arrest, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He's been teaching and preaching. He's been teaching his disciples. He's been talking to the crowds. We've heard parables. We've learned lessons. We've watched as the Pharisees and Sadducees have tried to trip him up, asking him questions that will put him to the test, the test that they're hoping he will fail, which will give them reason to arrest him. But we know that Jesus did not fall prey to that. He has turned them around. Every question that they've used to try to trip him up, he has used to give lessons to them and to us. But now he's telling the crowds and the disciples exactly who the teachers of the law and the Pharisees really are. Not who they say they are, not who they purport to be, but who they are. They're hypocrites. They do not do right. He tells his disciples, he tells the crowds, you have to obey them, but don't do what they do. They don't practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and make other people carry them. They're not willing to carry that load. They make their phylacteries wide. That's a leather box that used to hold scrolls of scripture. They would literally wear them on their foreheads for everyone to see. And the tassels on their garments long. The tassels on your garment were supposed to show your faith. So they made them extra long so that people could see how big their faith was. Unfortunately, they didn't show how big their faith was. Jesus tells the crowd they love their place of honor. They like the most important seats. They love to be greeted and called rabbi. And then he gives them this advice. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled and whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. These were probably pretty harsh words for the Pharisees to hear. I mean, they're not accustomed to people calling them out on their hypocrisy. But here Jesus is once again doing things totally differently. He's not revering them. He's not calling them rabbi. He's pointing out who they really are. And then he's admonishing the crowd. You have one master. You're all siblings. You have one teacher, the Christ. And he tells them, the greatest among you will be your servant. He will be our servant. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled, and whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. This is the opposite of what the Pharisees want to do, what they are doing. They don't humble themselves. They exalt themselves. And so Jesus is saying, the Pharisees, they're exalting themselves. They will be humbled. I'm sure this was wonderful news to the crowd who wanted Jesus to come and be king. He wanted them, he wanted him to overthrow the government. That's what they thought he was there for. They wanted him to be king. That's not what he was there for, at least not in the way that they were thinking. He didn't come to be king of the land, the governmental king, the ruler. He came to be the king, capital T, capital K. He came to be our savior, the Messiah, the Christ. And so we have to look at his words. We always should look at his words and ask ourselves, where are we in this? What is he saying? Not only where are we as a church, but where am I? Where are you individually as we read these? It's not easy when somebody points out that you're a hypocrite. It's not easy to look deep and say, is this hypocrisy? But that's what we are called to do. Now I'm sure we all can think of examples of when somebody else is being a hypocrite. Always easy to point it out in someone else. And I'm sure we all know people who um, brag about being at church on Sunday, uh, post about every faithful thing that they do, and yet they might not necessarily really be walking the walk. Maybe they're just talking the talk. It's that car 
with the Jesus fish on the back that then cuts you off in traffic and maybe uh, hollers something out the window at you and you think, that doesn't match, that doesn't seem right. There's that old joke about the woman who got pulled over and the police came up to her window and hauled her out and did it like a felony stop and she said, what is going on? And they said, we assumed this car was stolen because on the back it said follower of Christ and you, you know, cut this person off and flipped them off and you know, and then they list all of the obnoxious things that that person did, which indicated to them if the car is owned by a Christian, it couldn't possibly be that driver because she wasn't acting like her bumper sticker claimed she was. So again, not easy, but let's take a look. Let's take a look at ourselves and see if we are acting like the Christians we claim to be. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you claim to be a Christian. You are a Christian. So let's act like Christians, right? Now, what does that look like? In what ways are we falling short on this? And I'll tell you what, right now, this week and the weeks leading up and this week and probably a couple of weeks from now, we are really going to be put to the test, aren't we? It's election day on Tuesday. We have a lot of anxiety about this election. Regardless of how you vote, if you've already voted or will vote, the candidate you choose, the election will come and go. Time always keeps turning. The world never stops spinning, right? So Tuesday will come and Tuesday will go. And, well, like all elections, we won't know for sure who the winner is. This one might take a little bit longer, they're saying. There's a lot of contention going on. And with COVID happening, there were a ton of absentee ballots and mail-in ballots, ballots that have to be counted separately, some of which will have to be verified. Now this happens every single election. The news likes to tell us on election night who their predicted winner is, but really they're still counting votes. The states don't certify their ballots until December. So we got some time. The problem is that the news might not call the election on election night, or they might not call it correctly, because again, lots of ballots that will still have to be verified and counted. So, this puts us in this um, high stakes election, high emotions election. We're not sure when we'll even have an answer. We'd like it Tuesday night, but we don't know if that's going to happen. It's likely that it won't. So we're, we're stuck in this anxiety ridden space. And we are called to be Christian in that space, in every space. So, what are we going to do in the next couple of days as people are getting angrier and more anxious, as things are getting more intense? What are we going to do at the polls? If there are people there who are disruptive or, or whatever is going to happen, what do we do? How do we act like Christians in the midst of all this uncertainty? Well, I'll say the same thing at this election that I said last election is regardless of who is in the White House or the Congress or the House of Representatives, the Senate, regardless of who our political leaders are, our God never changes. Jesus Christ is King today, tomorrow, always. And that's a fact, that's it. It doesn't matter in what country you live, it doesn't matter in what state you live, it doesn't matter if you're thrilled with the outcome of the election or you're in the deepest pits of despair. Jesus is King. Jesus is the one master, the one creator, the one teacher, the Christ, the greatest among us. And Jesus didn't come to be a leader. Jesus came to be a servant. 
So yes, the election matters. Please don't get me wrong on this. This election is hugely important. Every election is hugely important. The politics of any country, it matters. It matters in our daily lives and it matters in the daily lives of people around us. It certainly matters in the daily lives of those marginalized voices who don't always get heard. And we are called to look out for our siblings. We are called to look out for one another. So elections are important. But one thing to remember throughout is that there is one Christ. You have one teacher, the Christ. Jesus calls us not to be hypocrites. Remember, we just talked, we just talked about this, to love one another is the most important commandment, to love God and love your neighbor. We have to show that. And we're gonna be put to the test, probably. <laughs> there are going to be people who put us to the test. And it's going to be difficult especially if you're one of those people who's very passionately involved in the politics of this country or in the politics of the world. We're going to be put to the test. And that's okay. We can do this. We can lean on one another. We can walk forward together. We can be examples to the world. We can be the examples of finding the best way to love one another. And like I said last week, we're gonna screw this up. We're human. We will. But we can try to get it right more often than not. We can learn from our mistakes. We can move forward. We can remember this. We can vow that we don't wanna be the Pharisees. We are not going to go to church on Sunday and then act like hypocrites on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. We're just not. We can make that pledge. We can do that and struggle through it together. We can figure this out. Because I'll tell you something else. There have been really consequential elections many times in the history of this country and in every nation in the world. And God is still God. That does not change. Christ still reigns. He is still alive. He still rules the day. And that never changes. Policies change. Administrations change. People change. But God does not. That is what we need to remember is that we don't want to be the Pharisees. We don't want to be the hypocrites. We do want to be servants. We do want to humble ourselves. And if that means closing your mouth or closing your computer when you desperately want to say something to get the other guy, take a deep breath. You can do this. We can do this together. I know that we can. We are, we're about to take communion together. We are about to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We are about to remember that Jesus broke the bread and when we eat that bread and drink that cup, we proclaim his saving death until he comes again. We have Jesus with us in this feast. Eat the bread, drink the cup, and vow to allow that to nourish you spiritually so that we're ready for whatever turbulent week ahead, whatever that looks like. Again, whether you're celebrating or crying, whether you're overjoyed or angry or depressed or sad or happy or confused, whatever your emotions are, time is fleeting. This is fleeting. Christ reigns forever. That's the truth. Amen. Let us go now into a time of prayer for and with one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord, as we pray today, let us lift up all of our siblings in Christ all around the world. Let us remember those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are hungry, those who are alone. 
And Lord, we ask that you would have our paths cross with theirs in real and meaningful ways, that we might be your face in the world, that we might be your hands and feet, that we might serve and love one another. On this day and every day, Lord, we pray for all of those people who yearn to seek your face. And we pray, Lord, that we might help them see it. Lord, for those people who are sick in mind, body, or in spirit, Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, for all of those people who are sick with COVID, this global pandemic that seems to jump up every time we think it's finally tampering down. Lord, we pray for all of those people who are suffering from COVID and we pray, Lord, that you will heal them, that you will give doctors and nurses answers. We give you thanks for all of the people who have wonderful health care, who are being cared for by the best doctors and nurses. And Lord, we also pray for those people who do not have health care, those people who are trying to heal at home. And Lord, we pray, we pray for your healing touch to be felt by all. We pray for the doctors, nurses, scientists, lab workers, all of those people who are working on the treatments for COVID. And Lord, let us not forget how many people are suffering for other reasons, for other illnesses, other sicknesses. And we just pray, Lord, that they will feel your presence too, that they will be healed too. Lord God, we know that sometimes the best healing is when you call somebody home and there they know no sorrow, no pain. They are completely filled with your joy and your love, Lord be with us as we celebrate their homecoming, even as we grieve their loss. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we gather around the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper. This table, while here in the sanctuary at Orange Beach Presbyterian Church, it's not our table, it's not a Presbyterian table. It's the table of the Lord, and all are invited to partake in this feast, to taste, to drink, to remember our Savior. You are invited. The way we will do this is I will indicate when it is time to take and eat the bread. If you are viewing this with members of your household, then offer each other the bread. And as you do so, say, this is the bread of life. I will then indicate when it is time to drink your juice or wine, whatever you have ready. And if there are others, you will serve each other, saying, this is the cup of salvation. While we cannot be physically together, we spiritually join with our siblings in Christ every time we take communion. We are joined in our love for him, our remembrance of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord, you are most holy, and we give you thanks that you join us for this meal, this time that we have to remember your son. Lord, as we remember, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Pour your spirit out upon these, your gifts, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, that as we eat and as we drink, we will join together in heart and in spirit, not only with our siblings in Christ, but with you and your son in ways that are unfathomable and ununderstandable and yet so precious, so sacred. Lord God, we give you thanks. As we sit before this meal, we give you thanks that we have this community, that we are able to share together this meal, just as Jesus sat with his disciples, just as he shared that meal with them, just as he served them. Let us use this meal for our nourishment, 
our spiritual nourishment, that we might feel the energy to go out and do your work, to be your servants in all of the ways possible. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat with his disciples, and he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, he poured it, and he said, this is a new covenant written in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink this, remember me. And indeed, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take your bread, your wafer, your crackers, and serve one another. This is the bread of life. and take your cups, serving one another. This is the cup of salvation. Drink and remember him. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this meal together. We give you thanks for the community that we are. We give you thanks that you join us whenever we are in community, whether we are physically together or physically apart. You are always at our center. You light our path, Lord, and we walk that path following you, walking with you and going where you would have us go. May this meal give us the spiritual nourishment we need as we walk forward with you. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
have reached the end of our worship service, but let it be the beginning of a wonderful week ahead, a week where we can catch glimpses of God at work each and every day. For as we part ways, we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. God's children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.